Bibles this morning, I'd like you to turn please to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're coming to the end of uh, our series in the book of Hebrews and uh, next week we're going to conclude. But those who have written commentaries on the book of Hebrews, they tell us that there are two parts to this book. The first part is from chapter 1 verse 1 through to chapter 10 verse 18 and that's the doctrinal section and we've completed that. And then chapter 10 and verse 19 where we're going to commence this morning is the exhortation or the application of what the writer has been speaking about in the previous chapters. So we're going to look at chapter 10 and verse 19 and we read these words. Therefore brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, last week I made mention of the fact that, you know, sometimes we sing things and say things that are not scriptural. One of those things is we often talk about coming into the presence of God. Now, you might have just read that verse 19 where it speaks about entering into the holy presence. And you might say, well, there you go, you see. Um, here we're exhorted to come into the presence of God. And verse 22 speaks about drawing near to God. But if you've been with us over the last few weeks, you'll notice the, the importance of studying something in its context and understanding who this epistle was written to. These particular words were not written to Christians that we've just read. They were written to a Jewish community who had been uh, taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're, they'd been enlightened. They'd seen that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lamb of God. They've tasted the word of God and the power of the age to come. The Holy Spirit has borne witness to them that this is the true and living way by miracles and signs and wonders which they saw with their eyes and they're at the crossroads. They've either got to come into the faith, which means to leave the, the Jewish faith to which they previously belonged, or they're going to turn back and go back into Judaism and abandon their pursuit of Christianity altogether. And so it's crossroads time now. And if you've been with us over the last few weeks, you know that I've shared that in this book there are five warning passages to this particular group, not to Christians, but to this group of Jewish seekers. And the first warning was one of a warning against neglect. How should we escape if we neglect this so great salvation? The, the picture is there it is, but it's drifting by. The time is going. It's not going to be here forever. Take it. Come in to the faith while this is still a day of salvation. The second warning was one of unbelief. A warning against unbelief because unbelief is something which is in the heart. So it doesn't matter how many miracles and how, many, how much evidence you bring to an unbelieving heart. There will never be enough evidence because an unbelieving heart is looking for reasons not to believe not looking for the truth. And so they were warned against that. And then the third warning was the warning, the warning against the danger of not going on. They'd come to a stop in their pursuit of the faith. Instead of going into the new covenant, they'd stop dead in their tracks because Christians were being persecuted and those who identified with them were being persecuted. And so it was not an attractive option. And so they'd stop dead in their tracks. And now here's the fourth warning. It's the warning against going back. See, here's the thing. When it says here, let's enter in, it's not talking to you and I. We have entered in. 
In verse 19 it says, let's enter by the blood of the Lamb. Friends, when you believed in Jesus, you were washed from the thing that separated us from God, that is our sin, and we have entered into his presence. We have entered in, verse 20, by the new and living way, which is Jesus. Amen? Amen. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we come to the Father by him, we enter into the presence of God. Verse 22, we have entered by faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. We spoke about how the conscience is the real barrier that separates us from God. Well, thank God when we believed in Jesus, the veil was rent from the top to the bottom so that we come into the presence of God. So he is not addressing us as Christians. For example, as we often say, now we're going to come into a time of prayer. Let's come into the presence of God. Or now as we come to worship God, let's come into his presence. You are in his presence permanently. You are the temple of God. Where God is, you are. Where you are, God is. You will never go out of his presence. But here is an exhortation to these Hebrews. There's alternatives set before them. Will you draw near? Will you come in or will you draw back? See verse 22, let us draw near. Come on, let's draw near. It's time to draw near. It's time to come into his presence. Verse 38, the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, that is destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And so that's the option that is set before these Hebrews. And it says in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. They had confessed Christ. They had professed an interest in Jesus. Now friends, anyone can profess to be a Christian. Amen? There's a difference between a professor and a possessor. One who professes faith and one who possesses faith in Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about that. That's the subject today. How do you know the difference? We'll talk about that today. But it goes on to say in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. Now that word wavering in the, in the Greek is actually the word aklinos, from which we get the word incline or to lean towards. To lean towards. Which way are you leaning? That's the question that is being asked of the Hebrews. Which way are you leaning? And you know which way a person is leaning by the confession of their mouth. You know what's in their heart by what comes out of their mouth. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen? So when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, you knew that they were really leaning back towards Egypt because that's what they said. Amen? That's what came out of their mouth. You knew which way they were leaving. They were wavering. They were leaning back. And the Hebrews, who had come so far in their journey towards coming into the new covenant, were very clearly leaning back towards Judaism by the way they spoke and by what came out of their mouth. And so in verse 24, he exhorts them, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now here's the situation. When, when, when a person is leaning the wrong way, the worst thing they can do is isolate themselves from fellowship of those who are going on. Amen? You need to be in fellowship with people of like mind. This week I got a phone call from someone, or rather an email I should say, and I often get this request, this question asked me, because they know that we are a grace church. Do you know of a similar church in our town? Because we want to be with people of like mind. Because if you're the only one that's believing something and, and seeing something and, and confessing something, but all the others are contrary to that and saying the opposite, eventually 
they will impact upon what you believe. And that's why the writer of the Hebrews says, come on, you're, you're, you're in this Jewish community, but you, it's time to come into Christian fellowship, to be with people of the new covenant who are speaking the same thing as we are speaking today. Amen? Now you say, well, are you sure that this is really addressing those? The next verse makes that very clear, verse 26 and 27, because it says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Now, if what I'm saying is not true, if actually these words that I've just read beforehand were addressed to Christians, then this is addressed to Christians too. We can't have it both ways. Amen? So that means that if a Christian sins once, willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there's no way he can be forgiven. Now, how many here, since they've become a Christian, have at least once sinned willfully? It looks like most of us. There's a few that haven't quite done that yet. Well, I'm amazed. We're in the presence of some very holy people. Seriously, that would, that would wipe all of us out. Because it's saying if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. There's no way you can be forgiven. Now it's talking about these Jewish people who have, who have received the knowledge of the truth. They've been enlightened. Remember we looked two weeks ago at the difference between being an enlightened soul and a regenerated spirit. Having an enlightened soul and a regenerated spirit. Their eyes have been opened. They've been exposed to so much truth of the gospel. They knew very, very clearly. In fact, the word knowledge there is not the usual word knowledge, which is gnosis, but epinosis, which is full knowledge. These Hebrews knew more than enough that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. They had ample evidence set before them so that they were without excuse. They had professed an interest in Jesus, but now they were thinking about drawing back, which we call, we use that term apostasy, to be an apostate. Now let's make it clear. First of all, there is a difference between an apostate and an unbeliever. If you share the gospel with someone who is not saved and they reject it, that does not make them an apostate. Okay, because they've heard the gospel, but they haven't had this experience of being so enlightened, of having so much evidence set before them that it's uh, uh, irrefutable. But they've just heard the gospel and they've rejected it for the time being. And, and God in his grace and mercy gives often people many opportunities to come to him. Isn't that true? Maybe, maybe most of you here did not come the first time you heard the gospel. But, but after several hearings of the gospel. So there's a difference between an apostate and an unbeliever. But there's also a difference between an apostate and a backslider. This passage is not referring to a backslider. Many backsliders have almost despaired after reading that passage because it seemed to say that, okay, now that I've sinned and willfully gone back into uh, sin, there's no way back to God. But that's not saying that. Praise God that God in his mercy is always reaching out to the backslider. Um, there's a difference. So let's have a look here. Here's, here's a difference. Here's the difference. 2 Timothy 2 verses 12 to 13. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. That's nothing to do with salvation. It's talking about the believer who reigns on earth will reign with Christ in the life to come. Amen. To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am seated with my Father in his throne. God wants to share his glory with us in the age to come. And those who are overcomers in this life will reign with him in the next life. If we endure, we will also reign with him. That's nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is a gift that we receive by faith. 
Now, if we deny him, he also will deny us. That's apostasy. That's someone who once professed an interest in Jesus and a faith in Jesus, but they weren't truly born again, and now they've renounced that profession. They've said Jesus is not the Son of God. His blood does not forgive us and cleanse us from our sin and give us eternal life. They've actually made a statement that refutes a previous profession of faith in Jesus Christ. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, that means unfaithful, he remains faithful. Aren't you glad about that? In other words, if in our walk over the whole course of our lives we fall from time to time and fail him, he is not a man like us. He, he, you know, don't bring God down to our level. He is faithful when we remain, un when, when we prove to be unfaithful. Amen? He cannot deny himself. Now, you say, what's the difference? I think a good example would be Peter. Peter denied the Lord. You say, well, it says there, if, he, if we deny him, he also would deny us. But what he denied is that he knew the Lord. He didn't deny that Jesus was the Son of God. He did not die, deny the efficacy of uh, his saving blood upon the cross. He was asked, Do you, you're one of his, aren't you? And he said, no, I don't know the man. He denied knowing Jesus. It was a moment of weakness. It was a moment of terrible failure. Did Jesus say, that's it, I will deny you from ever? No. He went looking for Peter after the resurrection. You see, Peter was unfaithful at that time, but Jesus remained faithful to Peter. And I believe that's in the Word of God so that many who have been discouraged because of their own failure can take encouragement in the fact that he is faithful when we are unfaithful. Now, it's, it's a very serious passage, this, that we're looking at right now because it says in verse 27 that if anyone, having professed that Jesus was the way, the Son of God, and the only way into the presence of God, then denies that, then it says it is impossible for them to be forgiven. It says that uh, there remains no more sacrifice for sins because Jesus is the only sacrifice. Where, what are they going to go back into? There is only one sacrifice for sin, and that's Jesus Christ. And so all that remains is a certain, certain, not dubious, a certain expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. The same holy indignation that burns against sin that is found in God will be directed towards those who stand before God in their sin without a saviour, without the saviour. The Bible says that when sin was laid upon Jesus, God did not spare his only son. God did not spare his only son, but his wrath was poured out upon his only son. How shall we escape? Or, or anyone who stands before God in their sin expect to escape if they are not in Christ? That's what that verse is saying. And it goes on to give an example. It says, anyone in verse 28, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse, worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a, a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? Now the thing about comparing these two covenants is this, friends. We've been looking all the way through that the, the new covenant is far superior to the old covenant in many ways. We can't go back over all those ways now. We don't have time to go back over that, that ground. But we've seen how it excels the old covenant in so many different ways. But it's like that also in terms of the penalty for those who reject the new covenant. The punishment is even greater than those who rejected the old covenant. 
Now, what that means is that in the Old Covenant times, if someone denied God who was under that Old Covenant, if there were two or three witnesses that came forward and said, this man has renounced Yahweh as his God and has gone after other gods, we've seen him. If there were two or three witnesses, that man would have been stoned to death. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying here, there are three witnesses to apostasy. The first is the Father. The Father has sent His Son and He will give testimony to the fact that His Son has been trodden underfoot. That's, that's um, a form of rejection. It's, it's, it's the most powerful way, the most, uh, sort of most insulting way that you can reject something is to throw it on the ground and trample it underfoot. And the Father will bear witness that these who have been offered Jesus ultimately have rejected him and trodden him underfoot. Secondly, the Son will be a witness. The Son gave his blood upon the cross and these Jewish people, these Hebrews, regarded his blood as just a common thing, the same as any other man's. In other words, he did not die on the cross to shed his blood to save us from sin, but he was an imposter. He was a pretender. He deserved to die. He was a criminal. So his blood was just the blood of a common man. And then thirdly, the Holy Spirit will come forward and say, I bore testimony to the gospel as it was being preached to these Hebrews, and I was insulted. I was rejected. I was turned away by those who were hearing the gospel. And then it goes on to say in verse 31 that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, this whole passage, I mentioned, at least I asked the question just a little while ago, how do you know someone who's professing to have a faith in Jesus Christ, whether that faith is genuine or not? And the answer that's being given all the way through this passage is basically you don't know until the end because he that endures to the end will be saved. A faith that is genuine will endure to the end. That's what the, the Word of God is teaching here. Um, in chapter 6, I believe it's around about verse 10 or 11, it says that we are those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. See, a lot of people profess faith in Christ who no longer walk with him and have renounced him altogether. Some have even gone into other religions and have t totally turned away from God. They had a profession of faith, but it wasn't a possession of genuine faith that saves. And so what the writer to the Hebrews teaches is this is that faith will always be tried for that reason. In fact, as we're going to see right now, we go through many different types of trial and testing. But ultimately, there is only one test and one trial, and it's the trial of our faith. Amen? That, that may be expressed in various kinds of ways, but ultimately... It is a trial of our faith. It's a trial to test the genuineness of our faith. Because the Bible says that not only are we saved by faith, but the just shall live by faith. So when you come to know Jesus as your Savior, Jesus is your resource for everything in life. Jesus is your sufficiency in all things. And what we do is we turn our eyes upon Jesus in the midst of our trials. We call upon him, as it says in this epistle, to find grace to help us in our time of need, to draw into our lives, as it were, the strength of God to persevere, to go through, and to triumph. And so we read, for example, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, 
In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation that is the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? It puts a perspective upon our trials and our, and our tribulations and our testings that we don't get if we don't see and understand that all trials are ultimately one test, and that is the trial of our faith. Now, Jesus pointed this out and illustrated this point in the parable of the sower. You remember he said that uh, some seed fell upon stony ground. It shot up initially. And it looked like the real thing, but then it shriveled and died and, and it was no more. And he explains that he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word of God and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now the, 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 the faith that we have is tried in many ways. And in the New Testament times, and especially in the first two to three hundred years of church history, the two main ways that faith was tested was what's mentioned here, persecution. And that's what these Hebrews were going through. Persecution is an endeavor to frighten us out of our faith, to frighten the faith out of us. Amen? We don't know a lot about that in this country. But in many other countries around the world, this is a real thing. Believers are tested on a daily basis because of persecution. But the other way that uh, people are tested is not to frighten them away from their faith, but to entice them away from their faith with things like false teaching, false doctrine. It says here that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will go off into excursions and, and away from the truth. And that's enticing them out of their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, these things are real and these things um, uh, become a part and parcel of our lives. If you, if you look at chapter 10, we look at the Hebrews here and we see in verse uh, 32... But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated. That word illuminated means to be enlightened. Okay? So their eyes were opened. Remember that? When your eyes were opened, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both of reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became comp companions of those who were so treated. And then the second thing is that we read in verse 35, therefore do not cast away your confidence. They, they had a confidence, they had a confession, a profession of faith. Their eyes were open, they professed the faith in Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 36, for you have need of endurance. See, faith must be coupled with patience. He that endures to the end will be saved because it's not their enduring that saves them. Don't get me wrong. It's not their ability to keep up something. Their endurance manifests a genuine faith that is in Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen? And so that's what they're exhorted to do. And what you find in chapter 11, so chapter 11 is this great chapter of faith. We've often read this, in, in, or been taught it maybe in, in, in an incorrect way, um, and this is the way that it's often taught. This is what your faith can get you. Amen? We use faith to get things from God. But that's not what this is about. Chapter 11 gives a, a gallery of the saints of God in the Old Testament times who had a faith in God, and that faith was tested in various ways, just as your faith will be and my faith will be, theirs was tested in various ways. Let's have a look at chapter 11. 
In the first couple of verses, there's um, a definition of faith. It says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word substance means, it's the word hypostasis in the Greek. Hypo is under, stasis is to stand. So it's something that stands under us. In other words, it's a foundation for our lives. So faith is a foundation. Now, how does that work? Well, faith comes from God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. In other words, faith is something that God initiates, not we. We don't say, I'm going to have enough faith to believe for this and then God's got to do this for me. No, no, you're the initiator there. But true faith, God initiates. He comes with a promise. We respond to that promise promised by faith, God-given faith at that. And that becomes a foundation for the rest of our lives. Amen. So any, any, any faith that doesn't flow from grace is presumption. Amen. Faith is always a response to the grace of God at work in our life. God comes to us, gives us a promise, we respond by faith, and that faith actually becomes a foundation upon which our lives are built. And then the next thing we see is that faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith always produces evidence. Amen? Faith always produces evidence. It, there, there's a response that comes from us. You know, just this week we had, we had a bit of a time with our family and there's quite a few people gathered together and I was just watching our two-year-old grandchild coming up for two years old anyway. <laughs> and uh, she was uh, she was walking around and all these big adults kind of like you know it's, this is a whole strange world because she's usually just with mummy and daddy right so all these adults around her and she was she was quite confident but every now and again you could see that she would stop and there was this uncertainty there and the thing she would do would be to look around to locate either her mummy or her daddy and once she's located one of them, it's okay. She goes back to playing. Everything's cool. If she falls over, the first thing she does is, where's mommy and daddy? See, that is the evidence of natural birth. Natural birth leads to natural faith in parents. Spiritual birth does the same thing. When you're born again, your whole security and focus is upon God as you go through life. As we go through trials, as we go through uncertainties, we go to God. We go to Him because He's the one we trust in. He's the one we look to. He's the one we draw from. He's the one that has resources for our lives. And so as we go through life, there is an evidence of our faith which keeps bringing us to God. Amen? We're born of God. It's a God thing, this faith. And there's evidence to that in our lives. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. And, and as we go through life, our faith gets stronger and stronger. We become more confident in the Lord. And we, we go to him more and more and more. And we trust him more than anyone or anything else in this life. And so that's faith. And by faith, it says in verse 3, the elders... That is, the Old Testament saints received a good testimony. Now that doesn't mean they had a good testimony to share, although of course it does include that, but it means that their faith was testified to. Who testified to their faith? God. God bore witness to their faith. Because faith is it's almost like an electric circuit. It starts with God, it comes into our heart, it goes back to God and God bears witness to it. It's a circuit. The whole thing is of God. And then he gives several examples in this chapter, and we can only just touch upon a few of them. He says, for example, Abel, by faith Abel, verse um, 4, offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and, though it, and through it he being dead still speaks. 
Abel and Cain came before the Lord. They came in different ways. One brought the fruit of the ground. The other brought a blood offering. And it was by faith that Abel came and by presumption that Cain came. In other words, there must have been a revelation into Cain, to Abel's life that this is the way you approach God, through the shedding of the blood, which points forward to the Lamb of God who will one day take away the sin of the world. Maybe his parents testified to that as they had the revelation, or maybe God spoke directly to Abel, but by faith he responded. And friends, he was tested because his brother was hostile. His brother became his enemy. And faith is able to endure even when it meets opposition. And why do you think he's saying this? Because the Hebrews were facing opposition. Religion always attacks faith in Jesus. And they were being opposed and they were being, um, uh, uh, you know, they were being attacked because of their faith. And so their faith was being tested, but it endured. Abel's faith endured, even unto death. Amen? Enoch is the next one. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. How did he please God? Next verse tells us. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. See, Enoch walked through this life I think in isolation. That's the impression I get when I read the life of Enoch. There were many people not walking with God, but he walked with God. He didn't need people. He didn't need the things of this world because he believed that God was a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. His reward was in God. His faith was tested and he endured until God took him. Then we read about Noah. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. He was tested. How long did he preach? 120 years. He was building a boat that wasn't even anywhere near the sea and there hadn't been any rain. Talk about testing. The whole world was mocking him. But he just kept being faithful because God had laid a foundation in his life and he was giving evidence to that by the way that he lived and by the way that he operated. Then we come to the next example of faith, which is the most uh, uh, common example of faith in the New Testament. In fact, it takes up 12 verses in this, uh, in this chapter, and that's Abraham. He's called the father of those who believe. Amen? Verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as, a, as, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Okay, so here's Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Abraham comes from a far country to a land that God says he's going to give him, and he lives as a pilgrim in this land. He lives, they dwell in tents, no permanent dwelling. And, and they, 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 do, they never build a house. Their faith is tested many times, but... There's a foundation that's laid in their lives and they give evidence to that by the way that they live as pilgrims on this life. Look at verse 13. Verse 13. It says, These all, speaking about those three patriarchs, died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, etc. Now, when God spoke to Abraham and his um, descendants, uh, Isaac and Jacob, he promised them three things. Number one, he promised that they would possess their own land. He would bring them to a land which he would give to them. 
they never saw the fulfillment of that promise. The second thing he promised is that he would make of them a great nation. They never saw the fulfillment of that promise. The most that they ever had Jacob when he went down to Egypt, they were able to count almost 70 people. That's not a nation. The third promise was that through their descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. They never saw that. They never saw the fulfillment of that. But you know what? They kept their faith all the way through the journey of their life. And as they came to the dying moments of their life, each of them, Abraham passed on, what's the inheritance, Dad? What are you going to give me? It's a promise. <laughs> this is the promise. Pass that on. I believe this with all my heart. And he passed it on to Isaac. And Isaac did the same. It says in um, um, verse 20, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Not things that were there, but things to come. Jacob did the same. It says that Jacob was leaning on the top of his staff, barely able to support himself, just about you know, breathing his last breath. And he spoke promises to Joseph because he believed them with all his heart. His whole life was regulated by the promises of God. He was a man of faith. And Joseph did the same. When he was dying, he called the elders of Israel together. He gave them instructions. He said, when I die, I want your descendants to take my bones back to the promised land. I know we're going there. Amen? They gave evidence to their faith all the way through. Okay, time's gone, but let's just look at one other example. Verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. See, by faith, Abraham, uh, sorry, Moses was able to renounce his old identity and embrace his new identity. We are a new creation. And faith enables us to do just that. To renounce who we once were and to, uh, to hold on to who we are now. See, Moses was a Hebrew, but he was brought up as an Egyptian, brought up in the courts of Pharaoh, destined probably to become the next Pharaoh. He had a bright, glorious future. Most, he would become the most powerful man on the earth. But there came a time when, when this um, conflict of interest within him, who am I? Is there, uh, do I belong to this race of people? Or am I truly one of God's people? And remember the, the, the crisis time for Moses came when he saw an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew. And he had to make a decision. Whose side am I on in this conflict? Which one of these are my people? And he threw his lot in with the people of God. And it cost him dearly. Amen? But he killed the Egyptian and he fled. Into the, into the desert until God brought him back again. And friends, there comes a time when we give evidence to the faith that we possess by the way that we behave. There's a story that's told of um, Alexander the Great who was once inspecting his troops and there was one soldier that was just clowning around, just fooling around. And he, and he caught him and he called out to him. He said, soldier, what's your name? And coincidentally, his name also was Alexander. And so he thought this was a bit, you know, smart. And so he said with a smirk on his face, Alexander. And Alexander the Great looked at him and he said, soldier, either change your ways or change your name. Amen. See, we teach a lot about identity in this church. 
When you know, and we, 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 we believe you start with identity, who you are. God writes it across your heart. You are a son of God. You are a child of God. Because when that is written across your heart, the rest of your life will come into alignment with that which you are. Amen? We are a new creation. Paul says, as you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk in him. Amen? And so all I'm saying all the way through here is that every one of these ones profess the faith in God which laid a foundation in their life to which they gave evidence by the way they lived their lives on the earth. God changes us from the inside out. That's what faith does. And faith enables us to endure to the end. Let's just read this last little list in verse 32. We'll wind up with this. Verse 32, he says, What more shall I say? In other words, I could go on and on, all the way through the Old Testament. For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousnesses, Obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. See, they all saw great things, but then the list changes. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourging, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. See, all of chapter 11 is a commentary on this one truth that our faith will be tested. Maybe you're passing through a trial right now. Maybe you're passing through a difficulty and you've wondered what this is about. Well, there's only one major purpose of a trial and it is the testing of our faith. Where are you leaning when you are tested? Which way are you leaning? Are you leaning away from God? Are you leaning towards God? God because the just shall live by faith and as we walk by faith that faith is born evidence to the world and to us especially by the way we, we respond to our trials and this does not say that any of those people that we've taken out of chapter 11 were faultless or perfect. Many of them had failings, but God remained faithful. Remember? When we are faithless, He remains faithful. But they endured to the end, keeping their eyes upon Him. And that's why it goes on in the next chapter, and we're going to look at that as we finish up next week, to keep our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for the word of God. We thank you, Lord God, that you come to us sovereignly. You initiate faith in our hearts. You give us faith. And Lord, by your grace, we bear evidence to that faith by the way that we live and because we endure to the end. And in it all, Lord, we want to thank you that from beginning to end, it's all your work. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It's you who begun this good work in us, who will perform it, perfect it, and complete it. Great is your faithfulness to each and every one of us. And we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. May we take encouragement and strength today from your precious word.
in Jesus' name. Amen.